Good. Okay, on we go. So this is about reference rot, um, and I hope I'll explain as I go along exactly what that's about. Um, does this one work? No, that one doesn't. Ah, oh, moves by its own accord. Um, so this is the general overview. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Hyperlink as the project and about reference rot. I'll produce some evidence. I hope you'll enjoy that. And then, having frightened you, the heebie-jeebies, we'll give some uh, remedy as to what could be done. That's the plan, anyway. So here we go. Um, does this one work? I'll, I'll tell you what. There we go. I'll use the keyboard. Okay, so reference rot. It's a combination. It's more than ring, uh, link rot. It's also content drift. So link rot... Um, You'll understand uh, a few times you get hold of this. It's the 404. It frightens the life out of you. Um, it's not there. Uh, web page gone. Uh, so content drift is what's at the end of the URI that it's changed. Sometimes it's dynamic content. It said one value one time. The next day it says a different value. Also, at the end of that URI, uh, the whole content can change completely. Sometimes what used to be a really useful reference now turns out to be a poker site or something even more exciting. So we've got a project called Hyperlink, funded by Andrew Mellon Foundation, which involves um, a, an international team. Um, those, some of you will know Herbert von der Sample, uh, working also with our language technology group in the School of Informatics and Adina. So that's the project team. So what are we doing? Well, we're creating evidence on the extent to which reference rot exists. Uh, most of our um, work is actually on uh, journal articles. We've got a very large corpus. Um, some of you from the States particularly may have picked up the uh, Harvard Law Library and Perma CC. But we're now obviously looking here at theses. So you can see what we're doing. We're trying to understand the workflow, but we're also working on some prototypes in order to uh, solve the matter, or at least help alleviate the matter, and then uh, come into places like this. So firstly, the evidence. Well, actually, I started to think how I could retread some old slides. Uh, so from 1998, it turns out I was actually doing something about online theses um, and a presentation in Bergen. Um, and thanks to Susan Copeland for actually uh, writing this, and so it's on the record somehow this thing existed. Uh, digging up one of the slides, which actually, coincidentally, I can get hold of from Bergen. I didn't have this. Um, at least three of these things work. A thesis is a contribution to knowledge and it's a product of training. It's a strange thing. It has a life history. And um, also, it's the role of the awarding university is very critical. You can't blame this on the publishers or even ProQuest. Uh, the, the university has to take control of this and do something responsibly. So we set about measuring this. Our data source was firstly to think about how we could get a large corpus of uh, postgraduate theses. Uh, interest in the doctoral thesis. Uh, we went to the catalogue of NDTL and um, selected some metadata out of that and then went to the institutional repositories to download. Um, and we downloaded about uh, 7,500 or so from five universities named here. We look particularly at the ones from 2003 onwards because they give us a more sensible sample with reasonable distribution across each of those uh, universities. So that's what we looked at by way of the data to begin with. That's our source. Uh, we then converted those uh, PhDs from uh, PDFs uh, into XML. Uh, we located the references and extracted every URL we could find in there. Um, this is uh, not me personally, but some very able people in the School of Informatics Language Technology Group. And we extracted something like 47,000 URIs. Now, some of those are to the scholarly record. We're not talking about those. Others were to the web at large. These are the ones that change over time. So this is where it's resource needed for scholarship rather than being the product of scholarship. And as you can see here, there's an increasing usage uh, to those references to the web over time. Um, a very simple graph. It looks very pretty. Um, What's interesting is when you start looking inside and you do the comparison for um, um, between theses, so this, uh, everything gets a bit messier because you're looking there at the variation. So this is a, a, what's called a box plot of mediums and interquartile ranges uh, on a log count, as you can see it more sensibly. 
what you see to begin with there, there's one particular thesis with 1,300, 700, uh, 1,300, almost 1,400 references. This was quite a curious thing. It actually was on the web. The thesis was on the web. All these references were back to themselves. It's a, a sign of things to come. We, moved, we didn't want to analyze that because it's really a way outlier. Um, what we tended to look at was those theses from 2003. There are some other outliers which we, we either did some robust methods or, or, or move those outside because they're a bit special. Um, but you can see there's the, the basic data. What we wanted to do was to see firstly whether or not those URIs still work. It, do they make a reference to something still live on the web? And we had a method whereby we looked at redirects and went on and on, so it's not just simple, there are redirects, until eventually you find something you don't with a 200. The other thing we did was look inside the um, uh, archive web. Is there a memento? Is there some record of that? And here we're using, obviously, the uh, memento technology from Herbert von der Sample at the uh, Los Alamos. Um, and so that's the, the, the general sketch. There's a poster at the back if you want to have a quick look at that again to refresh your memory. Um, so that's the general question. Um, and we use the date time to be near the time the thesis was defended. So there's a bit of approximation going there, but that's as good as we could do. So firstly, what does that say? Well, it says that actually over a third of those references to things on the web are not there anymore. They have rotted away, so to speak. They have disappeared. You can't get hold of them even if you try very hard. So that's a third. Now, looking again at those five universities, in some sense that holds pretty good, because it, you can see that it's more or less a third each time across each of one of those universities. So that's some confirmatory stuff. So we're doing a lot of exploratory, but it's a pretty firm indication of something, a general process that goes on regardless of the university. Also, quite honestly, the older the citation, the less likely to be on the web. So this is an inevitable process. You know, things rot on the web because the web changes over time. It's just a feature of the web. The web is a now web. You cite it today, it's gone tomorrow. Don't be surprised. That's the way it is. So we looked at the archive web and we found there's more or less a 50-50 chance that the thing that you referenced is in that archive from what you could call incidental archiving from the web archiving processes. So about half, therefore, of those references are at risk of loss. Very simple conclusion. Again, look inside the um, uh, universities, and that's confirmed there. So again, that's a pretty solid sort of piece of evidence, I think. Incidental archiving, actually, that doesn't really change over time. It's a constant that's uh, uh, going over time. But this is a 50-50 chance, and so what we've got to do is improve upon that 50-50 chance. Again, a very simple idea of what we've got to go and do. If we look inside the 2x2 two two table, we'll see that 18.4% or so has been lost. It's gone. Forget it. That's gone. You're extremely unlikely to get that back at all. But there is 34% where it's still at risk. It's live on the web. It's not been archived. You can do something about that. Before you leave the room today, you can do Well, maybe not before your room. But you need to do something about that with proactive archiving. So, okay, some devising a remedy. What can you do? So we started to think that we should show you that there is a problem, it is severe, it needs attending to. So what can we do? The phrase is transactional archiving or proactive archiving. So you've got to be able to fix the scholarly record because you're reckoning these ETDs are part of that scholarly record. So what we did is we tried to understand the workflow, devise some prototypes, uh, do some coding, and try and test that out. So that's, we're in the middle of doing this, okay? So we've not finished our project yet. It's due to finish in April. We might go as far as next uh, July or so. Um, so where have we got to? Well, firstly, those workflows. Maybe there are three. We're suggesting there's a study workflow inside the preparation of the doctoral thesis. There's a post-submission one. Goes on the examination one, maybe. And then there's a post-award. And there are different actors involved. So to begin with, the first one is really the doctoral student and the supervisor. It's them. They can do something about that inside that workflow, maybe in the preparation, maybe in the review. And then there's the university and the library, if you like, your last stop. I don't know too many baseball metaphors or whatever, but long stop is um, cricket position. 
Um, so you've got to try and work out these are opportunities to intervene to make remedy in the process. So firstly we've got thinking about plugins to allow this proactive archiving. Secondly, to change some of the um, uh, use of HTTP so we can annotate an HTTP reference. And thirdly, a piece of um, uh, maybe infrastructure which might be used um, by repositories to stop the rot, so when you get hold of them further down the line. So the plugin is firstly a plugin with Zotero, because Zotero is available, so there's been some code written on Zotero which allows you to trigger something, also with OJS, because we're thinking about publishing more generally here, not just on ETDs. So we're trying to attend and speak to the publishers later on. So in, in, in spring, we'll talk to uh, UKSG, to the publishers about this. So there's the plugin for Zotero triggers the archiving of your reference web page, puts it in an archive, bring back the URI, which is date stamped, and directs it to that place in the archive, and then uses it alongside the live web reference that you've made. So it cures it, it stops the rot because you triggered the archiving of the page that mattered to you. So the next thing is this missing link. So here's just an example. Um, some of you will get this, some of you won't, but essentially you get a simple URI to a reference somewhere, and then what you're doing is augmenting it with a date timestamp and the location pairs. In other words, you've linked together the archived copy and potentially more than one archived copy, as well as the live copy. And then if those two approaches work, then everything's fine. That really is perfect. We're doing the right thing. We've got a new way of working. On the other hand, there's a lot of stuff that's already happened and maybe, maybe students won't be good. <laughs> it's a possibility. Um, so you've got to do something post that. So again, we're coming up with something, a notification hub. We're looking at this. We're still a bit wet at the moment, but we're quite confident that it's going to go in the right direction. We're testing out with workflow, with resource sync, with core database you, you heard mentioned and with Archive Today. So we're, we're, we're not with that exactly ready, but we're, we're testing it out and it looks as though it might be good. So the next steps really are for you and for us. So you heard mention in Meta Archive being very interested in this and the work being done by Gail and by Matt. So we're hoping that this might be part of the set of tools that will be available and more generally shared. Um, and essentially, we're not gonna stay in this ETD area necessarily for very long. What we want to do is to, is to build something, write the code, and if EndNote want to use it as well as Atero or somebody else, uh, some other commercial system wants to use it, we'll write the code so they can do that. So thank you, and that's the end of the talk. Just before I go, I'm, lead, I'm seeding a question to about what's happening with the scholarly record and the fact that it ain't on your shelves no more. And you know what? You should really worry about that too. <laughs>